Good morning, Citizen Church. It's my honor and privilege to speak to you today, and I'm looking forward to the next few moments that we have together. Hey, if you're visiting with us for the very first time online, we would love to connect with you. You can see right here on the bottom of the screen ways that you can do that, and we would love to give you more information about our church, what's being accomplished here, and uh, it would be our honor to do so. So we hope that you take the time to do that. The next few moments, I want to talk to you about my virtual reality. Pastor Dustin, Dustin has done such an amazing job in the last several weeks in talking about this topic of the reality in which we are in. You know, when we were thrown into the coronavirus and it became a national threat, it transformed our world drastically. And it threw us into a virtual reality, such as, you know, there are virtual meetings, virtual school, virtual work, uh, virtual workouts virtual church. I mean, that list can go on and on and on because that's the reality in which we are living in right now. This morning, I want to talk to you about another reality of life, and that is we are living in a troubled reality. We're living in a world of great trouble, and again, that's the reality of the world in which we live. It was Peter in the Bible that knew so much about trouble. He had experienced it so many times. And I want to read to you in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 what he says. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. What he was saying here is that trouble is natural. Trouble is a common course of the life in which we are in. And when we're experiencing trouble, there is nothing strange about that. It's just the world in which we are living in. You see, as I'm speaking to you today, some of you are experiencing maybe the deepest time of trouble of your life. While others, maybe you're just coming out of a season of trouble where others may be getting ready to enter into a time of trouble. But trouble is the reality of life. It's everywhere. We have trouble in marriages, trouble with our kids, trouble at work, trouble with a neighbor, trouble with our finances, trouble with a sin issue, maybe even trouble in our health. But there are trouble, there are trying times in all of our lives. You know, when trouble shows up, it creates such stress and anxiety in our lives. Many times to the, the degree that it will lead us down the path of depression. And the reason why is because the trouble has become so large that we cannot deal with it and we realize it's bigger than ourselves and we lose hope. What I want to do is I want to talk to you about a message that Jesus preached in Matthew chapter 7. And here in Matthew chapter 6 and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, this amazing teaching of Christ. And I want to read to you the last illustration of this amazing story, uh, uh, sermon that he preaches. And so here I want to start in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. And it's listed here as the wise and the foolish builders. It says, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Then the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. What Jesus is talking about here in this ending illustration of this message is that there are two paths. One is the path of the wise, and the other is the path of the foolish. The two paths, one is building on a firm foundation, the rock, while the other builds upon the foundation of shifting sand. It's important also to understand when Jesus talked about the foundation of rock and the foundation of sand, that the very same thing happened to both houses. When you look at verse 25, he's speaking to the one who built upon the rock. In verse 27, he's speaking to the one who built upon the sand. But they are the exact same words. Let me read them to you again. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat 
against the house. The Bible tells us that the rain will fall upon the just and the unjust. The difference is, is the foundation in which we build upon. Because if we build upon the rock, he will carry us through every storm and every troubled situation we come into. In this amazing message in chapter 6 and 7, here it's the Sermon on the Mount preached by Jesus. When he spoke these words, it was words that came out of the mouth of God himself. It was of divine proportions, and it was the exact formula for us to follow to live out our Christian experience. Then he sums it up, and he says, Build upon the rock, and do not build upon the sand. Build upon the rock, and do not build upon the sand. You know, people today are exactly the way they were 2,000 years ago. Can't you just hear someone sitting in the crowd looking at their spouse and saying, you know, we've got to find a better preacher than this. I mean, this is so elementary. I feel like I'm sitting in a children's sermon talking about two houses, one built on a rock and one built on the sand. But the master, the greatest teacher who has ever lived upon this earth understood this, how important it is for us to always go back to the basics. You know, John Wooden goes down as one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. He coached at UCLA, and, and uh, year after year, he took his team to the championship. And every year, he also would recruit brand new high school seniors graduating, and he was recruiting the finest and the best in the country. As he brought them in, they were, they were you know, many of them probably prideful and ready to show what they could do, that they knew that they were going to be outstanding. That many people knew that these young high school players coming into the college level would soar through college and one day they would go into the NBA and they would become household names. Everyone would know them and they would become multi-millionaires. Well, as, as Wooden would bring these players in on the first day of practice, Instead of taking them to the basketball court, he brought them into a classroom, sat all of them down, and he said, today, before we do any basketball drills and before we dribble the ball or make any shots, he said, we're going back to the basics of basketball, and I'm going to teach them to you today. He turned around and he grabbed a handful of basketball socks that went with their uniforms, and he threw it out to all of these young new players. And he said, today we're going to start the game of basketball by me teaching you how to put on basketball socks. Can you imagine what they were thinking at that moment? All they wanted to do was get out on the court and show the, co the coach what they could do. And yet he's got them in a classroom teaching them how to put on their socks. In the very same way as he knew the power of the basics, the foundation, Jesus is coaching us constantly to go back to the basics and back to the fundamentals. What he was doing in this message, he was teaching us to go back and to remember how to put on our spiritual socks because storms are constantly coming over the horizon into our lives. And instead of losing hope in the time of trouble, in the time of devastation, in the time of storms, that we are confident that we know that we have built our lives upon the rock, upon Jesus Christ who stabilizes us. He is the one that holds us. He is the rock of ages. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Paul made a statement that is absolutely incredible. Here in verse 3 it says, And they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. What Paul is talking about is an Old Testament story. What I love so much about this is that when you read the Old Testament, you find that Jesus himself shows up so many times in the Old Testament, but he always disguises himself because it was not yet time for him to be revealed. In this story that, that Paul is referring to, was when Israel came out of Egypt 
And as they came out of slavery, Moses led them out into the desert, and they had traveled for many, many days. And now, all of a sudden, they had run out of water, the water supply that they brought from Egypt. And it was like, all at one time, they realized, we have no water. That Moses has led us out into the desert, and that we can only survive here three days without water. Then we die, our children die, and our life, livestock dies. And so they become angry. They start calling Moses names, and they even want to take his life. Well, God is listening to all of this. He whispers in Moses' ear and says, Moses, strike the rock with your wooden staff. Strike the rock, hit it. And so Moses hit the rock, and when he did, water began to gush forth. It's important for us to know this, that water was not coming from an underground spring beneath the rock, but the water actually came out of the rock. It was the rock that supplied their need. It refreshed them. It quenched their thirst. It was the rock that gave them new life by the water that came forth. Well, Moses then led the people in the direction of the promised land. When they arrived there at the entrance, the people refused to go in because there were predators in the land and they were afraid and they backed up and therefore they lived in the desert for the next 40 years of their lives. At the end of those 40 years, Moses begins to move them back in the direction of the promised land. And here God recreates the scene all over again that happened 40 years earlier. As Moses is leading them, they run out of their water source that they're carrying. All of a sudden they realize that they're out in the middle of nowhere and there's no water in sight. Moses has led them to their death because they know they can only survive for three days without water. Then they die, their children die, and the livestock die. And now as they come to this place, they start calling Moses names. And they want to take Moses' life. They are angry. God's listening to all of this. And he whispers in the ear of Moses. And he says, Moses, speak to the rock. Speak to it. So Moses right now is, he's frustrated. He's irritated. He's angry at the people because of their complaining and their murmuring. And out of his frustration, he doesn't listen to God. He doesn't speak to the rock. But he takes that wooden staff of his and he strikes it twice. And when he hits the rock, water begins to pour out of the rock. And the water refreshes the people. It quenches their thirst. It brings new life to them. They are revived by the rock that produces what they need. A few moments later, God seems to kind of pull Moses off to the side. and says, Moses, because you disobeyed me, because you did not speak to the rock, but you struck the rock, I'm not going to permit you into the promised land. When I hear that, I think about how harsh that really seems. But I want to remind you of this, the importance of this. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is absolutely critical that we hang on and obey every word. When it comes to the word of God in which we read, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we must follow and obey. Don't ever find yourself reading something and then justifying it and why you cannot obey it because your situation, your problem, your life is different from somebody else's. But every word is absolutely critical. What God was doing was he was setting up a picture of who Jesus Christ would be. That one day that the rock, Jesus Christ, would be struck. And when he was struck and down unto death, he took the sins of mankind upon his own life. But three days later, he came up out of the grave and he rose and defeated the grave and he became our Savior. Today, as, what God, or as God was illustrating all of this, today, all we have to do is speak to the rock. And when we speak to the rock, we're able to receive the miracles and the healing and the power in his salvation simply because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the rock who is known as the Rock of Ages. You know, people in the Old Testament, they knew that God was their rock. 
They just did not know that his name was Jesus. It was just a little while later when King David came on the scene, David knew that God was his rock. He wrote about it. He sang songs about it, such as in Psalm 18, where it says, For who is God besides the Lord? And he is the rock except our God. In Psalm 31, here in verse 2, it says, Turn your ear to me, come quickly to my rescue, be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. He is our rock today. You know, out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, there was this gigantic stone structure and it's called the Rock of Gibraltar. And, and here you find this, this huge rock formation that shoots up 1,000 feet above the, the sea. And, and there it is standing out of the water. If you would ever find yourself out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and you'd lost your way, you'd lost your direction, you can see this massive stone structure for miles and miles and miles, and it has served as a course of direction, putting people back on the course. This stone structure is made out of limestone, and it's the very same material that cement is made out of. This stone will weather the course of time. It will stand until the end of time because of its stability, the stone that it is. There's an insurance company in our country that has capitalized off of the Rock of Gibraltar and it has become part of their logo and that they're wanting everyone to know that their insurance company, that it's there to stay, it's as solid as a rock. You know, when you think about rock, rock formations, there have been many, many wonders of the world that man has built out of stone, such as the Great Wall of China, or the pyramids of Egypt, or Stonehenge in, in England, and they all remain because they have been made out of stone, and the rock is a symbol of stability. Also, when you think back in all of the old, old hymns of the church, so many of them spoke of Jesus as the rock. For instance, rock of ages, on Christ the solid rock I stand, Another song was built on the rock, or he hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock. Right now, as you're sitting there in your homes, as you're watching on your device, you are building your foundation. You are building it on stone or you're building it on sand. Every day, you're adding one more stone to your foundation or one more shovel of sand to your foundation, but we're all building some type of foundation. The question is this, what will your house do when the storm comes? You know, when the storm comes, I wanna remind you that we all need to go back to the basics. What is the basic? It's understanding that Jesus is my rock. Jesus is the one that I am anchored to and I'm able to ride through any trouble, through any situation. You know, if you find yourself at times praying and fasting and reading your Bible and paying your tithes, believing that that will keep you from trouble, you have been greatly misinformed. Because again, you could be the most righteous person in Citizen Church and yet still go through big, big troubled times in your life. You know, when you're planted on the rock, Storms will come and storms will go. But if you're planted on the rock, you'll ride through every single storm that comes your way. But not only ride through it, but you'll be better after it because of who you stand upon. You know, the Golden Gate Bridge has become such a, an icon. You know, we see a picture of it and we know exactly what it is. The, the Golden Gate Bridge was built back in the 1930s, an amazing structure. Not long ago, a professor of structural engineering from Berkeley did this extensive study on the bridge. 
And he looked at how they had built its anchoring systems and also that when great winds or hurricanes would come, that that bridge has the ability to shift and sway without ever breaking. When he finished this extensive study on how it was anchored and how it was built, this is what he said. He said, when the big earthquake hits in California, like everyone predicts, if and when the big one hits, he says, I believe the safest place to be in California would to be on the Golden Gate Bridge because of its anchoring system. What I want to tell you today is that in any problem you go through, any situation that you have, the safest place that you could ever be is anchored to Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. I just want to tell you today that trouble is a part of our reality, but also Jesus Christ is our reality, and he's the one that we stand upon. Maybe you're here today and you're watching, and maybe you've never really made that commitment. Maybe you've been partially committed, but what Christ was talking about in this Sermon on the Mount was being fully committed and where we don't just add Jesus to our lives every once in a while, but he is the center of everything. He's the center of our marriage, the center of our home life, the center of our work, the center of our finances. He is absolutely the foundation that our life is built upon. Maybe you have never invited Jesus Christ into your life to truly be Lord and God, the rock of ages. And you desire that more than anything else is to have the supernatural in your life. So I want to pray with you right now. And if you want to pray this prayer and just invite Jesus in, it starts a brand new life for you. Join with me and let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. God, I thank you as we read through the word of God that you are the rock of ages. Lord, the one that we can stand upon that will take us through every problem, every trial, every situation. And Lord, that we can come out on the other side victorious every single time. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I pray that those that want to invite you into their lives, that we just ask, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I want you to be my Lord and my God. I invite you to be that in my life right now. And Lord, I thank you for the miracle that is starting at this very moment. And we love you and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.